insects are an incredibly diverse group of organisms on Earth and it's so important for crop production. For example, pollinators, without them, our pollen uh, wouldn't get to uh, different flowers and fruit wouldn't develop. Uh, so there's no such thing really as a, as a bad insect. Um, there's just insects that are uh, doing things uh, that we want them to do in the right places and uh, insects that might be damaging our crops in wrong places. Um, keep in mind that a lot of the pests that we're about to talk about this week are naturally here in our environment. And the actual invasive species uh, many times is the crop that we're growing. For example, the peach tree that we grow on the, um, in Palisade and in the, uh, the western side of Colorado, that's not native to Colorado. Um, those trees were imported long ago from uh, China uh, and Asia, different parts of Asia, and developed and grown um, here. And so when we're talking about pests, we're not talking about good versus evil. Uh, we're really talking about um, taking, taking different organisms and putting them in a kind of a constructed environment in which they might not normally evolve to balance each other out. And so rather than thinking of, um, of pest management as a way to eradicate um, these evil insects, um, it's more an understanding of how, how can we achieve balance between um, potentially um, these two organisms that are just learning to coexist. So that said, uh, Entomology, the study of insects, is a vast subject, and entomologists um, learn lots of new types of insects that are out there all over the world, and we're using a lot of that knowledge to understand how pests operate in different locations, um, impacting crop growth, and also different ways that we can kind of manage those pests in order to make sure that we're not suffering crop loss or spreading of disease. All right, so when we identify insects, uh, it's important to keep in mind what their life cycle is. We'll talk briefly about that, and you'll learn more about that this week uh, in your reading. We also talk a little bit about how they damage crops to their mouth parts. For example, are they chewing like a grasshopper, or are they sucking and siphoning? Um, and then finally, location. Um, not just where on the plant they tend to be, but also um, different insects are going to cause um, issues in different locations. So while an aphid we might find on trees and house plants and uh, tomatoes, um, certain insects might only um, be a problem in um, the turf, for example. All right, so insects, as we mentioned, have three distinct body parts, um, three pairs of jointed legs, and these can be used for jumping or running or swimming, depending on the environment in which they live. Um, uh, most insects also in their adult stage have wings, uh, but keep in mind that males and females, um, when there are males and females, aphids, for example, it gets a little confusing, um, they are able to look different. So some might have wings and some might not, but depending on gender as well. Um, arachnids will group into invertebrate pests because they're also invertebrates. Uh, spider mites, for example, uh, are insect pests in a couple of different types of environments. And they are distinguished um, from having two body parts instead of three and typically eight legs instead of six. So life cycles are a really important thing to understand when it comes to insects because we need to sometimes, if an insect, for example, undergoes complete metamorphosis, we need to know what those um, different stages look like because we might be able, uh, able to treat, depending on the type of treatment we're using um, or prevention we're using, uh, one of these life cycle stages. Um, and typically, insects are not damaging to plants in all stages of life. Uh, for example, adults might have wings and fly away. Uh, whereas the larvae might stick around and feed on, um, on your different crops. And so knowing what those life cycles are is, is important. Um, most insects undergo either kind of a simple or incomplete met metamorphosis or a full metamorphosis. And so an incomplete metamorphosis looks kind of like uh, an egg hatching into a small version of the adult insect, whereas complete metamorphosis has um, four, let me see if I can pull that down, four distinct stages. Um, where we've got the egg down here hatching into a larva and that larva developing into a pupa and that pupa uh, evolving into uh, and metamorphosizing into an adult. So here's a better example. Here's kind of an incomplete or simple metamorphosis. They kind of look the same uh, with maybe some distinctions like legs or wings. Um, whereas a complete metamorphosis, um, they'd have very four distinct um, body shapes and sizes. For example, in um, uh, ladybugs or lady beetles, the adult little beetle um, 
is actually smaller than the larva, which can be very alarming. A lot of people uh, look, see ladybug larvae, which are actually quite beneficial because they eat insects in their larval stage and think, ooh, what is this awful bug? And get rid of it. Um, so when we're looking at diagnosing insect pests, uh, keep in mind that because of their life cycle stages, we might only be able to see them um, some of the time. Uh, so for example, a caterpillar um, is very visible, but uh, a larva that lives underground, for example, in the soil uh, might not. Uh, we also sometimes have insects that are so small um, that we can't actually see them with the naked eye very well, unless we have a magnifying glass, which I recommend having. Uh, so instead, we have to look at how they damage plants uh, and where that damage occurs and, um, and kind of um, make our best uh, judgments on those. Uh, a couple of methods for being able to physically see the insect. Uh, we call this scouting uh, when we're actually going through our greenhouse and we're actually looking at plants uh, or we're walking through our nursery and we're, um, you know, investigating um, leaves uh, or we're going through our field crops and looking at stems. Um, so we're scouting for pests and we can either physically see them uh, because they're large enough to see or I've got a little uh, method which will go over of, of finding them. Um, or we're looking for their actual damage. And so that's how we can kind of uh, begin the diagnosis. Let's talk about locations because um, some insects we're going to find all over uh, and some we're going to mostly encounter in different scenarios. So our aphids, for example. Most of you, if you've grown any kind of plants, have encountered these suckers. Uh, aphids are about, about half the size of a pencil eraser, probably smaller, um, depending on their stage. And they uh, can come in a variety of colors. You tend to see these green ones on houseplants and on um, uh, in the greenhouse in a controlled environment or tunnel, um, but they also live and thrive outside uh, and they can be uh, black, red, um, pink, um, so all different kinds of colors, but they tend to stay the same in shape and size. So they always kind of take on, if you take a look at this outline of the body shape, uh, very, very um, typical. Uh, aphids damage plants by kind of uh, uh, piercing through the epidermis and sucking out the juices, um, the, the xylem and the phloem. And in doing so, they often uh, secrete, we call it a honeydew for lack of a better word, but it's basically sticky poo. Um, so we sometimes see this insect, we sometimes see some stickiness on the plant, um, and aphids tend to love new growth. Uh, and uh, so you'll often find it on the emerging leaves, like at the tip of apical meristems, um, and they, uh, they love to feed on some of that new, um, new growth, which seems to be higher in, uh, in the nutrients. So uh, aphids are really common, and uh, there's a lot of different ways to control them. We'll talk about their control later this week, but you can mechanically spray them off if you're treating larger trees, for example, um, or a house plant. You can pinch them. I love to squish them on um, tomatoes. Um, there's biological controls. Ladybugs love aphids. Um, and there's also chemical controls, but keep in mind if you spray them with the chemical control, you might also kill um, the ladybug larva, which feed on these as a biological control. So all different sorts of ways. Um, aphids, very, um, very, very common chances are you've got them now on something, um, or you will have them, um, but a lot of different treatment options. White flies uh, are also very common in similar um, controlled environments like tunnels or um, nurseries and greenhouses. White flies tend to be on the undersides of leaves, um, so if you flip a leaf over, you often find um, that they might be there. One of the easiest ways to scout for white flies is just to brush the tops of the, uh, of the plant, and you'll see the little white flies fly up. They're very aptly named. They're small. They're white. Um, they're about the size of an aphid as well, so a little bit... Uh, maybe about half the size of my pencil eraser here. And uh, we also have traps, so mechanical traps um, for white flies. For example, a, a, a yellow sticky card, a piece of paper there, um, where when they fly they get stuck to, um, you're able to scout for them that way. Um, keep in mind, if you're going to use a foliar chemical control and you spray the tops of leaves with it, and it's a contact killer rather than systemic, um, these might be hiding on the underside of the leaves and might not um, actually um, be affected by that. So again, uh, thinking about where these pests are is important in control methods. Fungus gnats are pretty common, uh, and they're a, a common pest in hydroponics uh, as well as in um, soil-grown soil uh, plants. This tends to be, again, a problem more of a controlled environment, although we often sometimes see these in field crops. And uh, fungus gnats are often um, very um, 
very much related to soil moisture. How wet and how dry you keep your growing media um, can increase or decrease uh, the number of fungus mats you see. So again, when we talk about control methods later this week, um, uh, how you water um, can very much influence your pest infestation. Uh, fungus gnats are similar in size to white flies, maybe a little smaller. Um, they're black or brown, uh, sometimes clear, although rarely in color. And they spend part of their life um, in the soil. Um, so that's why soil moisture can influence um, how they grow and develop. Understanding what stages your, um, your fungus gnats are in uh, in terms of life cycle is important. For example, if I do a soil drench where I'm putting something on the soil to prevent um, any larval um, development, and these are already um, flying around because they're adults, then um, that drench won't be as effective. Um, similarly, if I spray uh, using a chemical, uh, then um, there could be eggs in the soil that will then hatch, so two weeks later, I'll have the same problem. And so spacing out the kind of control method I'm using based on the timing of a life cycle is very important as well. Ugh, mealybugs. I get these on houseplants all the time. Um, this is actually, um, Probably less of a problem in um, um, most controlled production environments, but we definitely see them on with customers and houseplants. Uh, they tend to love the petiole area, so where the leaf joins the main stem, although you can sometimes find them on leaves as well. And they, they truthfully look like just cotton. They often cover themselves with kind of this um, fluffy bit that they excrete. And so um, it's often very hard to see them. Um, you think it's just um, dust. Uh, but if you, you take a, uh, you know, a little tip of a pencil or a stick and you kind of pull that fluff back, you'll see these little ickies. Um, these are actually pretty tough to get rid of um, in terms of um, any method other than mechanical. I just scrape them off. Uh, and uh, mealybugs, again, kind of knowing where they are um, will help you, help you um, look for them and, and also treat them. Scale is another one that's um, difficult to treat um, because mechanically they're just really well protected. They are often very highly camouflaged as well. So scale, um, you often see these in um, houseplants as well as in field-grown crops, corn for example, um, where they're flat up against the leaf blade and very difficult to even see um, but can cause a lot of damage. Spider mites, um, so these are arachnids rather than insects. They do create very small webs, uh, which you can uh, sometimes see on the, um, again, the petiole. Um, but oftentimes on the undersides of leaves, they've made a, a very fine webbing. These suckers are fast. They're um, usually bright red or sometimes can be clear with two little dots or a, kind of a combination of that. Uh, but they're super fast and very small, so very, very hard to see. So many times, um, you can kind of see it here, um, they almost look like um, from far away that the leaf is just yellow. But if you look very closely, you can see that they're actually teeny tiny little dots where these um, little, ins um, sorry, arachnids have have pierced into the leaf. And so it almost looks like one of those pointillism paintings, little tiny yellow dots um, that are um, very, very um, close together. So again, um, a very common plant, uh, plant pest. We see these both in controlled environments as well as field-grown crops. Uh, thrips is another one which can go from your field into a controlled environment and vice versa. Um, they're super tiny and so they're able to get into even um, uh, greenhouses. Um, they make special screens, for example, to put in front of your louvers to keep them out. To show you scale, they're absolutely um, just practically microscopic, very, very tiny. Uh, the best way to scout for these is to go to flowers. They love um, chewing on pollen and nectar and being inside flowers, which can damage fruit production. And so um, I'll typically take a little card, like a piece of white paper or yellow paper, and tap the flower. And if they fall out, you can kind of see them. They're like little black specks. And so scouting, um, for different insect pests will require that you kind of know where they're going to be and what they look like. In field crops, we see some um, larger pests, grasshoppers, um, which can chew and, and, uh, and destroy leaf and, and other plant parts and plant tissues above ground, uh, as well as soil-borne pests as well. So we can also find nematodes, for example, which are tiny little um, unsegmented worms that can cause damage in the soil. There's a lot of different field crop pests. Um, we do see aphids and spider mites, so um, we're talking about those quite a bit. Um, but it's going to also depend on the kind of crop you're growing. Um, we're going to talk uh, uh, and, and have you investigate a, a little bit more about some pests that we find in different types of um, locations in Colorado. But again, keep in mind a lot of these pests, the pine bark beetle, for example, um, are native here. And so really it's not we're, uh, that we're looking to completely get rid of all pests, um, but instead to kind of manage the environment so that they don't cause damage to your plants and your crops.